Hi everyone, welcome to Wednesday night here at First Baptist in Berlin. We're glad you've joined us as we uh, finish out our series we've been talking about discerning truth. And tonight I'm actually going to uh, go to 1 John chapter 4. We mentioned the first part of that chapter a few times, but uh, we're going to look at uh, what I call a cultist test as we close out our series on this. Just give you some, um, I hope, practical insight of determining uh, whether something is true or not. Let's have a word of prayer together as we begin. Thank you, Father, for your precious word. And we ask you, once again, open our hearts and minds which you have for us. Meet the needs of all those who are watching this. And Lord, we pray that your word indeed would go forth with clarity and with power. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're a little bit of a history buff, you might I remember um, a man named James Marshall, actually, he was the first to discover gold in California. And in the months following that, the California gold rush was in full swing. The prospectors, James Marshall landed there in 1848, the prospectors became known, that they showed up the next year, as the 49ers. They all came uh, from all over to search for this precious metal. Well, they soon found out that not all the glitters is gold, and, and uh, iron pyrite was found in abundance in the area. To the untrained eye, the, it's a worthless mineral, but it looked like the real thing. That's what we call a fool's gold. In fact, even the very experience it sometimes could be fooled. And so they developed tests to determine if what they thought was gold, was it the real thing or was it uh, simply fool's gold? One test invi uh, involved the biting the rock in question. Not too good on the teeth, but uh, the reason is that real gold is softer than the human tooth, and so fool's gold is harder. That's how they would uh, look at it or test it in that way. A second test involved scraping the rock that they thought had gold on it on a piece of white stone. True gold will leave a yellow streak, but the residue from uh, fool's gold is a greenish black. So these miners depended on some very simple tests to determine whether what they found was a real thing. If they were wrong, that test could keep them from wasting a lot of time and hard work and from making a fool of themselves. Well, I doubt there's any gold prospectors listening to this study tonight. If not, gave you a little bit of free information there, but I believe it is important for us to understand that there are some things much more valuable than gold that need to be tested. False teachers and teachings are rampant in our world today, and we need to be able to identify what is real and what is fake. For a gold miner to be fooled, many lost fortune, maybe was embarrassed. But for someone to be fooled by false teachers could mean they would lose their eternal soul. Serious business. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, the apostle John lays out a very simple test to identify false teachers. And we do, we do well to heed his warning. This is what he says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, through our study here on discernment, of course, uh, in the age in which we live, the idea of discernment is really, it's because it's being discriminatory towards others who uh, teaching other things. It's looked down upon. It's not being tolerant. But it is, it is vital for Christians to learn to be discerning. We can do it with love and compassion, but we dare not back off on discernment. Scripture provides many warnings against false teachers. In fact, exposing false teachings is one of the main responsibilities of the pastor, pastor teacher of a church. In Ephesians chapter 4, remember the word of God says this, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. That's when we uh, are involved in church or we're involved in a, a strong a teaching ministry in which uh, our pastor or teacher is uh, going through the Word of God and showing us how we can discern truth from error. Spiritual fool's gold, by the way, though, has been around since the Garden of Eden. In fact, the source of error can always be traced back to satanic roots. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, Paul uh, warns 
Timothy, and us as well, of course, and he says this, Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last time some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. These people are hypocrites and liars, and their consciousnesses are dead or seared. Any ideology or philosophy or opinion or religion other than God's truth, it, it fits uh, Satan's agenda. He had, doesn't really care what type of material information he uses as long as he can um, somehow uh, destroy the truth. That's why it's so crucial for believers to recognize the difference between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Sometimes it's, uh, it's difficult. Uh, if you do not know the Word of God. If Christians are not discerning, they'll not only be confused, but then they'll not be able to convey the truth to others. We must guard the truth by knowing it and then firmly holding to it as a conviction and being able to distinguish it from that which is false. So remember this, and we've said this several times in our study, discerning truth is not optional for a Christian. It's not that we can just sit back and say, well, you know, maybe I'll think about being a little more discerning. This is what we are really required to do of God. In the verse we read, it talked about the phrase, do not believe, in verse number one. It could literally be translated, stop believing. In other words, there were evidently some of the believers in John's day who were not practicing discernment. That's why he is talking to them about this. And they're accepting the message of the false teachers. John's saying, stop it immediately. You've you got to knock it off. This is dangerous. We, we need to be like the Berean Christians. Remember in Acts chapter 17, we, we were talking about them in the area of discernment. Uh, Paul had gone to Thessalonica, and, and there uh, he's able to preach the gospel, and there's a church established, but it didn't take long, just a, a very short a period of time in the, uh, uh, many of the um, Jewish uh, uh, people began to stir up um, uh, individuals against Paul, and he eventually had to, to leave Thessalonica. So he goes down to Berea, and the Bible says concerning the Bereans, it says, now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, that is concerning the, the, the Jewish uh, people who are hearing the, the message. For they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. So Paul would go to the word of God, he would show them, the Messianic prophecies show now that this indeed was fulfilled in Christ. And uh, um, that's really the, the basis for his message. So the people in Berea, they, instead of rejecting his message right off the bat, they listened and then they checked it out in the scripture. And that's what we need to do is check out what we hear in the scripture. We're commanded to test the spirits, whether they are of God. And the only reliable way to test that is by looking to see what God has revealed in the scripture. Isaiah verse, uh, or chapter 8, verse 20 says this, Look to God's instructions and teachings. People who contradict his word are completely in the dark. So the word of God is the perfect standard for our truth. It's not our human opinion or the popular thought of the day. It's one of the reasons uh, uh, when I conduct Bible studies, you know, it's not a matter of sitting around and maybe reading a portion of scripture and saying, well, what do you think this says? I mean, we may have some discussion about uh, what someone sees in a certain passage, but it, it's not a matter of our opinion of what something says. It's the Bible says what it says. And we need to, it needs to be studied in such a way, and that's one of the responsibilities of a teacher is to spend the time uh, to be able to uh, show indeed what the Word of God is saying. But it's not a matter of, well, I think it says this, and someone else says, well, I think it says something different. It's the Word of God says what it says. It's not based on our opinion. It's not based upon what might be the popular trend of the day. Uh, the less biblical knowledge there is, the more false teachings there, there's going to be, and the more it will be accepted. And here's one of the problems that the mainline denominations are experiencing. They have, for the most part, have rejected the idea of, ins of an inspired and infallible Word of God. So they completely rejected the idea of the sufficiency of the Word of God when it comes to uh, knowing truth. And as a result, they are today accepting teachings which are in clear violation of, of the Word of God. 
sometimes you find people in uh, churches like that and that's not the way they were brought up and they uh, they're beginning to get a little upset and and i would say you need to be a lot upset if uh, the church you're going to is uh, embracing things that clearly uh, uh, in uh, contradiction to scripture and uh, either that church needs to pull out from that denomination or those individuals involved in that church need to get out and find a good bible preaching church uh, come out from among them and be separate the lord tells us so it's important as god's people that we recognize that we also need to be aware of satan's methods he, he masquerades the lies as truth all the time. He's very subtle. He uses, I guess we could say, the Trojan horse strategy to infiltrate churches with his deception. Uh, in Second Peter chapter 2, verse number 1, Peter warns us of this. He says, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. In fact, Satan's counterfeits usually contain some truth. Remember, it only takes a few drops of poison to contaminate something that might otherwise be a healthy substance. The cults may have a good point in their teaching. There may be something they say that is actually true, but the poison of false teaching completely destroys the truth uh, when it's mixed in with the error there of course that that is why it's absolutely necessary to test what we hear and so we're looking at god's guidelines for testing truth and this is in first uh, john chapter 4 i'm going to read from verses 2 to 6. by this you know the spirit of god every spirit that confesses that jesus christ has come in the flesh is of god and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So there's the test we're going to look at. There's actually three different um, things that we're going to be that we can see from this passage. First one is does that person we're looking at the one that we're trying to judge whether what they're saying is true or not. Does that person confess Christ? Does the person manifest evidence of the fruits of righteousness? And is that person committed to the word of God? And when you see a problem in any one of those areas, you know there's a situation here. You know that there's some truth mixed in with error. And be aware of that. Does the person confess Christ? That's very important. We're, we need to really understand what that means. The word confess means to agree with. The statement, uh, therefore that statement is, does the person agree with the scripture concerning Christ? I I don't think you're going to find most cults. I know for of Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, um, if you were to ask them, do you believe in Jesus Christ? They definitely are going to answer with the affirmative. And I think they believe that they do. They've been misled by, um, by the cult that they're involved in. But they think that they believe in Christ, but they do not believe in the Christ of the Bible. So they're not confessing Christ. It's, this idea of of who of what the scripture says about Christ it includes believing in the historical Jesus, the fact that Jesus existed upon this earth, but it also includes his deity. The truth is Christ is not just a created being, but he's God in human form. That's what the scripture says. And many of these cults, this is one of the things that they, one of the first areas they go astray in, is they do not believe that. Cults, uh, that this first point, both the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, uh, err in this area right at the beginning of indeed who Christ is. So that's a uh, very obvious sign there's something wrong with the message that's coming forth. Second thing is, does the person manifest evidence of the fruit of righteousness? Now that is not just asking the question, are they a nice person? Do they do nice things? Uh, do they say good things? Are they good neighbors? That's not necessarily the, the entire matter here. 
In the Incarnation, God became partaker of human nature. On the other hand, through regeneration, human beings become partakers of the divine nature, according to the Scripture. So all true Christians possess an incorruptible seed of eternal life, which means there's no satanic deception that can take them out of God's saving hand. Those who are truly born again have been given not only a supernatural insight into the truth, but a love for it as well, and a discernment that protects them from apostasy to that sense. Now, we know that this discernment depends upon the Word of God, and sometimes if we're not into the Word of God as we ought to be, we can be confused and misled. But for someone to embrace and to accept these false teachings and continue in them is an evidence that they do not know the Lord at all. Scripture says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us of God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. See, the indwelling Holy Spirit works in the hearts of believers to give them discernment in the midst of false teaching. And uh, this is something, if you're hearing uh, there many, especially uh, new believers and young believers would talk about this, that they, they hear people saying things, they don't know exactly what's wrong and with what they're saying. They, they're not familiar with the scripture to that point, but they, they recognize there's something not right there. That is the work of the Holy Spirit in their life, and the more they get into the Word of God, the more they're going to be able to develop their discernment. But that is characteristic of a child of God. Third, the question is, is the person committed to the Word of God? This is important. You see, the written Word of God is the sole authority. That's how we're to test everything. That's our basis, not our opinion, not our tradition, but it's the Word of God. So is that person really truly committed to the Word of God? Scripture says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's all we need to be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We do not need extra writings. We do not need uh, the opinion of some a committee of men, like the Watchtower Society or whatever, to give us the insight. We need the Word of God. That's what the Bible teaches. You see, many false teachers will claim to base their teachings on the Word of God, and they'll you know, do some great spiritual gymnastics trying to make Scripture say things that they don't and never were intended to say. But the reason is, and the problem is, that in reality, they're basing their interpretation on something other than the Scripture. For instance, the Mormons have the Book of Mormon. If you ask a, a Mormon missionary, they come to your home, you ask them, do you believe in the Bible? Um, they would definitely say, of course we do. But they also have other sources of authority. In fact, they use the King James Version of the Bible. And so there are, um, they, they will say, and, they, and I, I suppose that, that most of them believe and think that they do believe the Bible, but the doctrines they hold definitely contradict many parts of the Scripture. The uh, Mormons believe in the Book of Mormon as well, plus they have a couple other sources, the uh, Pearl of Great Price and uh, uh, the Doctrine and Covenants, which they use on the same level of authority as the Word of God. The problem is these, these things will contradict each other, and so their teaching is um, very confusing. It's obviously um, not based upon a scriptural understanding. The Jehovah Witnesses will claim, listen, we, we use nothing else. They don't have any other uh, writings, so to speak, as the, like the Book of Mormon. But they're basically basing their teachings on the obscure the interpretations of Charles Russell and then the Watchtower organization, uh, not upon a plain, clear understanding of the Word of God. Whenever anyone adds an authority other than the Word of God itself, there's where the warning lights should begin to flash. And you should recognize, well, there's something wrong here. I not understand exactly and see exactly what it is, but something is wrong. If there was something besides the Word of God is the authority. Be sure your belief system is firmly anchored in the infallible, unchanging, inerrant Word of God. Whatever it is, if we're dealing with cults or we're dealing with discernment in other areas, 
make sure that our basis is, is anchored in God's Word. True saving faith is not based on opinion. It's not based on emotion. It's not based on experience. It's not based on visions. Its foundation is God's revelation to us, the Scripture. It's an old hymn titled, How Firm a Foundation. The first part of it goes like this. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in His excellent Word. Interesting statement made in that song. I googled the hymn. I wanted to see the rest of the lyrics, make sure I had the right lyrics in exactly the right way. And what's interesting is it actually came up on a Latter-day Saints, a Mormon uh, site. It was said to actually, this song we sing all the time in our churches, it's said to be included in the first LDS hymnal. So one of the first hymnals that the Mormons printed included this hymn. And what's interesting, it talks about the foundation being his excellent word. And the problem is, Mormons don't claim the Bible as their only authority. They use it as a, an authority, but it's not the only authority. That is a problem, a very serious problem. Be aware that all that glitters is not gold. Be careful. Use discernment and follow God's test for truth. He wants us to be discerning. We need that in our life to keep us from error. We need that that we might know the Word of God and, and apply it to our lives. But we also need it that we can share it with other people. And that we can instruct those who've gone the wrong direction, who are caught up into false teachings. It is important to be discerning, to understand what the real thing really is. Well, we thank you for joining us in this series. And we are, uh, we'll be going to a uh, in-person Bible study on Wednesday night at our church at First Baptist in, in uh, no longer will be discontinuing the online version at this point. Uh, perhaps to start it up again or maybe be getting some type of a, uh, of a live stream. But at, at this point, we'll be going simply to the in-person Bible study. So I'd like to invite you to that if you're in our area. We'll begin at 7 o'clock. It will start on September 15th to be our first Wednesday night in our uh, in-person Bible study. First Baptist Church will be in the... Uh, uh, what is called the Saxby Hall, the fellowship area, and uh, uh, be studying the Word of God together. So we'd like to ask you to join us. I encourage you to be there if you possibly can. Thank you for being with us. I pray that this has been a help to you and uh, that your discernment of, of truth will be greatly enhanced. Very, very important for all of our lives. Well, my prayers are that you'll have a, a blessed week and that we'll get to, to see you again very, very soon. God bless you.